Thank you so much. Uh, can everybody here at the back? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so um, it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, to share our work with you. Um, <coughs> Uh, so, um, in a way, I would say architecture is really complicated as a discipline, <coughs> and I would say the forces and the challenges are only greater, and that our partnership is really a collaboration. <coughs> we have a small studio, uh, we have eight people in total in our whole studio, <coughs> and um, in a way, Howard and I work together. So, um, in a way, I have two images. One is <coughs> a view of the uh, QE2 and Howard came to Canada from England <coughs> when he was about two years old. I heard it was a really bad crossing and everyone got sick. <coughs> um, and I was born in Kingston, Jamaica, so I came to Canada when I was about seven years old. And in a way, <coughs> I'd never seen snow in my entire life and kind of... Uh, <coughs> um, so in a way, uh, both of us have very different backgrounds and we've kind of worked together for quite some time. <coughs> um, <coughs> in a way, both of us were nine years old when Expo 67 came to Canada. And in a way, this kind of amazing World's Fair with monorails going through geodesic domes, uh, <coughs> buildings that looked like Lego, and the kind of um, way that that represented, a f in effect, a modernity to the rest of the world about Canada was actually a really interesting thing. And to be a sort of kid sort of experiencing that. And both of us were there at different times. We didn't know each other. <coughs> So in a way, we live and work in Toronto. <coughs> and what I like about this image is you can see the Mies van der Rohe towers. There's about four of them in the foreground. There's an Edward Durrell stone tower in the back. There's a kind of uh, IMP stainless steel clad tower. But it's actually emerging out of this kind of gritty foreground. So this kind of industrial, kind of tough foreground. <coughs> um, Toronto's an interesting place to live. Uh, <coughs> there's a term called allophone. And Canada's founded on this idea that English and French are the two founding cultures, but the word allophone means neither English or French is your first language. <coughs> and so the, the kind of dis description of diversity is really that there are more allophones living in Toronto than anglophones or francophones. So the city is evolving and changing. <coughs> um, the city was laid out by British surveyors, and we have these system of back alleys. This is a photo taken by the kind of official photographer of Toronto from the 1850s. So you can see this kind of system of leftover <coughs> rear alleys. They would have had horse stables, uh, kind of all the kind of service things. And then this is a, a laneway now in Toronto, a contemporary laneway. <coughs> and in a way, one of the things we've done is map these laneways. And we realized there were 120 kilometers of these laneways in the city. And then um, with my students at U of T, we looked at I lanes, Z lanes, T lanes, and tried to classify the types and look at the frequency. And then we kind of remapped the city, not thinking about the primary big avenues and boulevards, but looking at the laneways as this enormous potential <coughs> and looking at them as a form of densification. We found this derelict lot in a back alley with abandoned Volkswagen vans and Mustang, a Chevy Impala, and saw it as a kind of huge potential, <coughs> and actually built a house in this laneway, really showing in effect that you can build a village in the middle of a city, you can take something that someone else would throw away and actually turn it into something really positive. <coughs> so this is a view from the inside looking out, and then a view from the outside looking in, and this kind of idea that, that architecture can actually <coughs> Make, it, make a difference by seeing something thrown away and turn it into something positive. In a way, our studio focuses on built work, so we don't do competitions, we don't do RFPs, we really just do buildings, <coughs> and we just typically get a phone call. Um, uh, this is a, a contemporary gallery called the Corkin Gallery in an area called the Distillery District, so there's a certain work we take on that really relates to a belief system, so we really believe adaptive reuse is really very much part of what architects have to be addressing. <coughs> uh, we worked a lot with artists, so this is actually an uh, art foundation in Hong Kong where the art piece is actually the floor. It's actually an, a Scottish artist, Jim Lambie. It's all metallic tape. And so our response was actually to make a ceiling that was perfectly plain and, and actually without anything on it so that you could actually read the floor, which was the art. <coughs> 
We've done tons of sacred spaces. Uh, this is actually a Taoist temple in suburban Toronto, but we've done chapels for Catholic nuns, synagogues, <coughs> and other non-denominational spaces. <coughs> so we're always linking our buildings with water. We're always blurring the boundaries between what is inside and outside. <coughs> um, we've actually designed spaces for the public realm. Uh, this is a pedestrian bridge that we did in a public park that we designed. Uh, and we love this kind of idea of seasonal transformations. We designed a kind of skating canal, uh, pedestrians walk over, skaters go under, it's a reflecting pool, and then it's also inline skating. And then we think about light a lot. Um, light is kind of one of the drivers of the way that we shape space. <coughs> it's free, so you don't pay for natural light and that in a way um, <coughs> it's a kind of key element in all of our work. Uh, <coughs> uh, the kind of way that we try to amplify the harsh winter light and then try to protect ourselves from summer light is kind of part of the way we think about architecture. Uh, <coughs> this is actually uh, in effect a dining hall we did for a summer camp. We created a light monitor so the whole piece going down the middle is actually two by fours. There's actually a greenhouse glazing up above uh, that, that ventilates and provides natural light. But with this light monitor pushing into the space, it actually allows you to tell the time of day, to understand in effect the kind of, the sort of way that light can help to shape your human experience. We live in Toronto at 43 degrees latitude, which is a seasonal climatic zone. And we're always trying to harness light as a force to help us recalibrate our understanding of place and context. And as architects, we like to kind of paint with light and use light as a way to kind of um, understand, A, where you are in the world, what the seasons are. <coughs> um, to speak about seasons, we really think winter is an amazing thing. Maybe it's because I came from a place without winter. <coughs> and so we're always trying to kind of capture our projects in the season of winter, summer, uh, the kind of the, the whole range of, of variety. Um, and I think it's really different when you have, live in an equatorial climate versus a, a more northerly or southerly climate. And uh, right now we're doing work in Hawaii, which is like this amazing place, but it is kind of close to the equator. And so this kind of, you don't get this kind of variety of seasons that I think we're really used to. So we think about our buildings in, not only in verdant summer days, but also in winter. <coughs> and we think about them from the inside out as well as the outside in. This project is in an, an existing apple orchard. And then we love using winter water all the year round. So, so we're always thinking about the way that water abstracts nature and connects us to nature in really powerful ways. And that we're always interlocking sky and ravine, water and sky, and we love the way that winter water is able to register these subtle shifts of temperature and transforms different states of being from steam to mist to ice. And so we really try to embed and interlock these conditions. <coughs> also for us, section is so important. Uh, <coughs> at the 2014 Biennale, we were asked by the University of Venice to draw sections at this huge scale of several of our projects. And it was actually a really amazing exercise. They were like these enormous sectional drawings. <coughs> and in two of these drawings, we just did some studies. Uh, this is a synagogue on one side and then a very small studio. Uh, the synagogue is this sort of shaped ceiling, but it's actually asymmetrical because it's about how the light is brought into the project and illuminates the space at different times of the year. And so, so the idea of how we can um, use light as a force is something we think about. So the small studio looks like this, where the, the, the thickness of the walls are all different and the way that the coffers actually shape the light is really key. And then in the synagogue, here's a kind of view where you can see a skylight and then a clear story tied together. And that inside what you're getting are these lines of, of light as opposed to shadow. So as Canadians, we actually asked them to turn the clabbered upside down, and they thought we were kind of crazy. Uh, but we wanted this kind of illumination of the kind of clabbered and to treat them as light as opposed to shadow. We also love materiality, and the kind of issue of making and shaping things is really key. 
So this is Howard uh, flame cutting uh, some Cortan steel. We do tons of full size mock-ups. We actually really try to test and understand the kind of material experience uh, in our work. And then scale is so fundamental. And so we are really interested in the scale of landscape, the scale of architecture, the scale of building, <coughs> and the scale of furniture. Uh, so this is a chair in cardboard that we designed. We work with a manufacturer named Neon Camper, we actually, uh, who manufacture and distribute it. So these are actually molded vacuum form plywood <coughs> that become the molds for the chair. Um, and this is a metal version of the chair, and then a firefly lamp that we also designed. Uh, so here's a view of the, the wooden, so there's a metal version and a wooden version of the same chair. And then we love kind of experimenting with how to put things together. So this was a sketch of uh, something we designed where we took a mason jar, like a, a standard kind of off-the-shelf jar. We started with pieces of mylar inside uh, and kind of used these to create, these ready-made pieces to create a new thing. And here's the kind of view of it, which was a prototype that we designed for a project. And then we developed that into a scientific glass. So this is actually a corning glass that you buy from a catalog combined with organic uh, cast resin pieces and then a, stain, a bronze mesh down below. So things that are kind of very sort of high and low kind of together. And then we embedded a phosphorescent powder in these cast organic pieces and so when you turn the light off, it actually glows, almost like fireflies in a jar, things you do at your cottage in the summer, and kind of always trying to somehow embed a kind of wonder and delight in the work that we do. So there's kind of an interest, interest in kind of how to put things together and what they actually mean. And also we love um, things like door handles. So Alvar Alto described the door handle as the handshake of a building and that it's the first thing that greets you, you touch it, it's very physical, and we've worked a lot in 3D printing. <coughs> so this is actually a, a, a series, so you saw the drawing, and then you're actually seeing a, at the far end a clay version, a wood version, 3D plastic versions that are really cheap, and then the final ones are actually 3D printed bronze. And it's a pretty great time to be an architecture student, to be an architect, because all of these technologies are actually under your control. You don't need to kind of, like we work with tons of fabricators as well, but the fact that you could actually do this from your computer, you send it, do it push a button, and then we actually end up with, you know, about a week later, a, a UPS package, and we see what's inside. So in a way, this kind of ability to control the actual outcome as the architect is a pretty interesting thing. Um, <coughs> we do a lot of 3D printing in plastic. <coughs> this is a light that we designed that was inspired by the Inuit uh, whale bones <coughs> um, in, in the far Arctic. It's very hard to have materials to carve with, and so they use everything. And whale bones are a kind of resource. <coughs> So we were really inspired by these Inuit sculptures and what you're seeing are all the component pieces that are all 3D printed. And then the light is actually inside and, and glows through the, the 3D print. And then we actually used it within one of our projects in a conference room in Hong Kong. So the kind of idea of being able to experiment at different scales and as an architect to actually be in control of the kind of these other, this other scale of intervention for us is really important. Uh, <clears throat> so what I want to do is just share two projects with you, and, but share their site. Because for us, site is so fundamental and so important to all of our work. So site scale, materiality, light, water, they're all kind of playing together and are all important in different ways in different projects. Um, Toronto um, is on the north shore of Lake Ontario. Uh, after the last ice age, there was a kind of huge, like a mile of ice, and as the ice is receding, you actually scrape and shape the land. And so this kind of post-glacial landscape is what we live with. And so these green spines are actually the Don River and the Humber River, are, which are the two valleys, and the city is actually in between the two. And that, that in a way, these river valleys are pretty special. Uh, in 1954, there was a kind of the perfect storm. It was called Hurricane Hazel. Uh, 
Toronto doesn't have many hurricanes. It's kind of not what happens there. And so there was this kind of like really catastrophic and, you know, disastrous event. But what it did is it made us appreciate the, these rav the ravine systems that we have. And before that, they had all kinds of factories and nasty things in them because it was cheap land. And then in a way, we started to appreciate what these ravines were. Here's a lone cross-country skier in one of these ravines. And, and in a way, one of the key writers, a guy named Robert Fulford, described Toronto ravines as the chief characteristic of our local terrain. And he called it our topographic signature. Uh, and then uh, Larry Richards, who was the dean of the architecture school, called it San F Toronto as San Francisco turned upside down. So as opposed to uh, thinking it's all about the topography, it looks flat, and it's almost this negative topography in the middle of a large metropolis. So here you're actually seeing this view of the subway encased in concrete. There's a road way down at the bottom, which is at the bottom of the ravine, and you're seeing, in effect, the skyline of the city and understanding, in a way, this negative topography. <clears throat> I don't know if you know of Adam Magoyan, really great filmmaker, but this is a, a film he did called Chloe, I think Neam Leeson, Juliana Moore, but here's a clip, like a still from Chloe, where the ravine is actually almost a character in his film, like you're seeing a double reflection and this kind of image of being in the city in this modern house, but really being in nature is kind of the play there. <clears throat> so in a way, one of our first projects was actually in the ravine. So imagine your first project has no windows, no doors, the only mechanical system is a pump, and there's a ton and a half of rusting steel. <clears throat> and in a way, I would say the kind of, what it taught us was to think about the zone between architecture and landscape. That, that in a way, the interesting thing isn't one or the other, but the kind of interlocking and the interweaving between them. <clears throat> um, so we were thinking about retaining walls and uh, grade beams uh, <clears throat> and uh, using real materials. Um, and it made us also speculate about the role of time and weathering <clears throat> and that in a way maybe if you designed a good ruin it could turn out to be a good building. So this is a photo of the same project taken 25 years after it was built. And in a way, it was closer to how we imagined it with nature taking over and maybe not being so pristine and, and the kind of role of, you know, moss and kind of like the weathering is actually a force that you can actually think about as a positive part of the way you see architecture. <clears throat> On the same property for the same client, <clears throat> this kind of small pavilion, and in Canada, our landscape is so huge, second largest landmass in the entire world, but our buildings, no matter how big we think they are, are tiny in footprint. So you're always having to make something small have a kind of bigger reach than it actually is. And so it, it's really extending water and bridges and ways that a small building can actually have a bigger impact even though it has a tiny footprint. And this kind of, <clears throat> and this is I think something that we think about a lot as Canadians. <clears throat> In the same, this is the same project, but we're always also thinking about how to create a new foreground to a found condition. This kind of ravine landscape is ubiquitous, but how do we reframe our understanding of it by creating this foreground to, to a background that we actually already know? So this kind of foreground background condition is ongoing and we think about it all the time. On the same property for the same client, <coughs> in effect, we're using uh, the leaf pattern of the, a black locust, so, so the Carolinian forest, which starts in North and South Carolina, actually ends in these Toronto ravines. <clears throat> and so the black locust is one of the kind of amazing trees. And so we took the leaf pattern of the black locust and we did water jet cutting to create the exterior filigree of the building. So we're always experimenting and testing ideas at many scales. And we've been lucky to work with really great clients where you can actually work for like, you know, 20 years on the same site and no one thing is so huge, but each one is an experiment that, that ties to the next. Um, <clears throat> so the two built projects I'm going to share, which is what I think were, was of interest to you guys, uh, was a, a, a residence for a group of Catholic nuns <clears throat> in Toronto and uh, a project called the Integral House. <clears throat> and in a way, the two of them are both ravine projects. They actually are on the same ravine, and you can see one from the other. <clears throat> um, 
the Catholic nuns actually went to see the integral house and actually loved it and it helped shape their thinking about what kind of home they wanted. <clears throat> so that's kind of what I thought we would just, so in a way I've just tried to give you a, just a short introduction to give you a sense of some of the things we think about as a way to understand these two projects. Uh, so if that makes sense. <clears throat> and then if there's time I have two projects that are unbuilt and just a series of experiments with those. So, so, um, so we'll <clears throat> um, go. So first of all, Sisters of St. Joseph of Toronto, they arrived in the 1850s, religious women who focused on health care and education. Um, and much of education for women in Toronto is really shaped by them. Uh, <clears throat> um, they also founded four hospitals, which is pretty impressive. Uh, <clears throat> they both built them, they ran them, uh, they worked in them as nurses, and they gave all of them to the government. So they're kind of now public hospitals, uh, <clears throat> but a huge contribution to the kind of urban fabric. <clears throat> so when we started the project, we actually didn't start with a sketch, we didn't start with a model, we actually started with a mission statement. And in a way it says the new home will be a sacred space dedicated to nurturing community based on continued ministry and outreach. It will demonstrate simplicity, beauty, and a wise use of materials and spaces. Accommodations suited to varied needs will be welcoming, accessible, ecologically sustainable, designed in harmony with nature, and with flexibility and potential for diverse use now and into the future. And that was a kind of mission statement that we actually developed with 150 Catholic nuns. Uh, so not an easy thing, but we actually worked through it, and that became, in effect, the kind of beginning of the project. And so the idea that words can have as much power as a sketch, and it became, um, when, we, when we were decision, making our decisions, we would refer back to the mission statement to see if we were doing the right thing. The sisters wanted the most ecologically sustainable building they could afford. And so in a way, we worked back and forth to see what, what could they afford. Budgets kept changing all the time, and it was very much about uh, uh, the, the, the finances and the real benefit. Um, m many buildings in North America are Leeds buildings. The sisters said, we actually don't believe in Leeds. We actually aren't marketing ourselves to anyone. We have this higher calling uh, that's more important. And so, so this is not a Leeds building because they kind of thought it was a bit bogus. And in the end, just wanted to do the right thing at every stage. Um, so in, this is a kind of axo, but what you're seeing is that there's a double loaded portion and then two wings that are single loaded. There's an 1850s house that we connect to and there's a chapel in the curve uh, that is the reflecting pool. Every time there's a curve, it's never occupied by, by private spaces, but always communal spaces. So dining areas or sitting rooms uh, as opposed to individual rooms. And then we actually again do mock-ups. So, so what does a, a monastery look like in the 21st century? Uh, we actually use uh, these long vertical fins that are sunshades, and that becomes part of the exterior elevation. We worked um, with really great companies in Europe doing uh, curtain wall systems. Uh, they built large size mock-ups. They tested them in all these labs. Uh, with all these micro points, it's a bit like you're having a, a checkup with sort of uh, <coughs> leads tied to you. Then they blast water and wind at it, and then they make a ton of revisions before all of the external pieces go into production. So kind of very high tech, but we said if you want a sustainable building, then your envelope has to be the best envelope you can afford, and it will pay you back every single day. So here's a view of the project in situ. <coughs> they really wanted to redefine, in effect, uh, what is a contour line, <coughs> and that they love the organic work that we had done, and so we really worked to reshape, in effect, the line between city and ravine. Um, and what you can see is that in the kind of uh, curve is actually the chapel, which is sitting in a reflecting pool. <clears throat> and here's another view of it where you're seeing the residential neighborhood and then the ravine edge and in a way a kind of negotiation between the two. The fatter piece in the middle is the double loaded piece and then the two single loaded corridors. And then here's a view of the chapel in the reflecting pool and you can see the skyline of the city in the distance. 
And in plan, <coughs> this is at the lower level, there are congregational meeting rooms for the whole order. Not all of the sisters live here, so there is room for 54 sisters, but their order is larger than that. Um, and then here you can see the kind of chunkier middle piece, the chapel, which is accessed both from the ground floor and the second floor, and then the single loaded wings that go off to either side. And then a section where you can see the kind of skinny part of the building, and then you're viewing the chapel, and then the building elevation beyond. And then again, you're seeing a section cut through the chapel where you can actually go from the sisters' rooms right into the second floor of the chapel for the most infirmed sisters. And then a view of the kind of May 1850s house uh, when they bought the site, they said, can we move it? <laughs> uh, can we tear it down? Because it's really not ours. <laughs> so I spent about a year convincing them that A, they should keep it, and B, we could actually make it part of this larger ensemble. Um, and uh, you can see this canopy, which is the main entrance, a view from the sidewalk, uh, and the kind of foreground. And then in winter, you're seeing the turret of the existing 1850s house on the right, and then the kind of view of the main elevation on the left. And here you can see these shaped fins. So they are uh, weathering steel on the outside, and then on the inner side is actually powder-coated aluminum. And they go up the building, and they actually provide shading for these long hallways. And then another view of the entry canopy. There are about 64 geothermal pipes that do all the heating and cooling for the building. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we collect all the rainwater. We have PV panels on the roof. And each one was kind of like a, we had a long wish list, which you saw in that little sketch. And then it was kind of, can we afford it? Price it back and forth. Prices kept going up and down. And at certain points, we had to make decisions. And in the end, it's actually a pretty amazing green building. But it wasn't like, like we, we want to do everything. It's like, can we afford to do it? Is this the right thing? Will it really be from a life cycle costing perspective, something that will really benefit the building over like a 20, 40, 50 year time period? So. Um, and then in winter. So we always think about what does winter look like and what does our building look like in winter. And so here you're actually seeing these single loaded corridors. They're illuminated. They have white oak on the inside. And then the sisters' rooms are on the other side. And then a view from uh, an, one of the upper levels, you're seeing the top of this entry canopy, this kind of the view of these kind of fins sort of collapsed. And then, and then the residential neighborhood um, beyond. The lobby, where you're getting this skinny lobby, we designed what we call our peanut columns. It's like a double column, fiberglass liners to create this kind of uh, double reading and then a single column. The reflecting pool, and then on the left is the chapel, and then beyond is the ravine. Um, so here is the double loaded portion. Uh, and a lot of the nursing stations, rehab, shared facilities are in this kind of, this middle portion, all the elevators. And then the single loaded corridors, which we saw as almost like urban porches. So, so this becomes, in effect, these light-filled spaces. Every second window is operable. So you can actually live in, in this uh, home, open windows, and have flow-through ventilation. And in a way, in buildings like this, that doesn't often happen. Also, sisters' rooms have windows in them so that you can close your door, open your window, open your window and your door, and there's different levels of engagement. <clears throat> and then a view of the chapel sitting in the reflecting pool where you can see the direct relationship between the sisters' rooms and the chapel, the reflecting pool, and ramps that head you out, out into the landscape. And then again, sections through the chapel where you're seeing the, the relationship between the two. This is the threshold to the chapel where you're actually seeing this kind of water as part of the, the disconnect from the main building and bringing you into the sacred space. And this is the second floor of the chapel where sisters will come in wheelchairs or in, sometimes in a kind of a, a moving, uh, they'll move beds in here. Uh, and so it allows the most infirm sisters to be part of the liturgy, to be phys physically and visually connected to uh, the, the service. 
And these are uh, large wooden fins that direct the light and also are where we put the Stations of the Cross, which they, we, they brought from their old uh, monastery into this new one. So we fixed them up and then re remounted them. And then a view, in a way, this kind of idea of pushing and pulling. So the building is pushing into the landscape, but the landscape is being pulled into the building at the same time. Uh, we designed all the liturgical furniture, like the ambo, the altar, to kind of be part of this experience where it was actually not an impediment, but visually, again, connecting you to nature. So here you can see the altar where you can look almost right through the base of it. And where the glass pushes in and the water is pushing in and the building is also pushing out. Um, and a view at night looking back so you can see this kind of play in winter. And then they also asked us to design the eternal flame which is a kind of really important part of the project because it's it needs to be on all the time and it becomes symbolic of the kind of fact that, that uh, the community is alive and uh, so, so we designed this special piece for them as well. Uh, so in a way in the same valley um, is a project called the Integral House. Uh, <coughs> it's for a pretty amazing client. He was trained as a mathematician but he was also a concert violinist and he wanted three things. He said, uh, I want curves, so curves were part of the program. He said straight lines are boring, and so, and that he was a calculus professor. So he was not only interested in, like, he didn't want a curving line, he actually wanted a shaped curving volume. Uh, <coughs> and um, so that was his first uh, request. His second was a concert hall for 200 people. Uh, in every house he'd ever had, he had concerts at the scale of 40, 50 people, which is much of chamber music started in people's salons and there's a very strong tradition, but he just wanted to do it at a bigger scale. And then he also said it had to be architecturally significant. Um, so here's some ver a very early sketch of kind of uh, thinking about it. We built tons of models. This is just one of a whole pile. Um, and then in a way we wanted to kind of, this idea of how do you paint with light? How do you actually develop a kind of piece of a building facade that addresses the kind of light condition of 43 degrees latitude? Uh, <clears throat> so we actually did that by actually trying to create what we call a, almost like a golden wooden curtain. And you saw an image of that earlier. <clears throat> um, so the way we ended up tectonically developing it is having an upper portion with 97 different fins and we did them all. Um, this is a drawing with all of them um, um, that was a computer file that we shared with our fabricators. <clears throat> and that the lower fins are deep, the, the window mullions are embedded into the side of the fin. So you actually don't see a window frame, you just see glass and wood. There is a frame, but it's actually just kind of embedded inside, and so it's just not visible. And this is a kind of series of uh, mock-ups but you're seeing everyone is numbered and they relate to the image earlier before. And uh, so each fin gets fitted, then brought back to the shop, then kind of treated with uh, heavy duty marine finishes and then brought back onto site. And here's a mock-up where you're seeing a few of them lined up and that in a way all you, we wanted you to be aware of is light passing across wood. Then below that and above that are what we call our standard fin. And when you see this in the drawing, you can see an Ipe cap at the top. The glazing goes in and again, it has a frame, but you just don't see it. And then there's a shaped wooden piece that actually protrudes into the room. And every fourth fin is asymmetrically loaded structurally. So it's kind of like a structural cage uh, clad in wood. And here's a, a full-size mock-up of that. So the darker wood at the top is the ipe, and then the glazing would butt into each side, and then you see the shape portion. And here's a, a portion where you're seeing this more repetitive fin as opposed to the one where all of them are a little bit different. And then here's some studies where we're looking at the heavier portion up above and the lighter portion below. So we wanted it to feel almost like 
revealing the ravine to you as you enter the space. So at the at upper <coughs> floor, it's denser and you only catch certain views. And then by the time you come down to the main performance space, the whole thing opens up. So here's the series of studies. And then here's the actual space where you're actually seeing it at a certain time of year. Um, and our client is there and they're kind of setting up. And, and then we actually documented the same from the same vantage point every season. So this is spring. In summer, it's this verdant wall of green. Then in the fall, it, it changes again. And then in winter, it changes. So the foreground stays the same. None of the fins are operable, nothing moves. But the landscape actually changes quite dramatically. And, and spatially, uh, you experience different things. And then this is a view from outside looking at it. And in a way, we're in the largest city in Canada, and in a way, we're trying to reshape our relationship to nature, and in effect, recalibrate the line between city and nature through our built form. Here's a view from the entrance, which really reads as a two-story building and almost slightly miniature in scale. And then from a section, you can see that on the ravine side, it's actually five stories. So you actually enter at, a, at the street level and you go down a full floor to the performance level and there's still another floor, two floors below that and a floor above you. So this topography, which is very much part of the idea of the city, is actually embedded in the experience of the house. Cross section where you enter at the upper level where you see the railings and you descend down to this double, in this double height performance space with regular floors below and above. In plan, at the lowest level, you're seeing, in effect, outdoor terraces that extend into the ravine. Then there's a kind of, that number two is a, an extensive green roof and gallery spaces. Then this is the ground floor of the performance space, and then the upper floor. So you're seeing the double height portion is where the X is open to below, and then living rooms and, and other spaces. So here's a view from the entrance. And this is what happens when 200 of your closest friends just come over for a little visit. <coughs> um, we, this is sort of uh, looking in effect along the contour line. So we're really creating views where you're seeing the extent of the contour lines in both directions. And Toronto is a very Victorian <coughs> city and so normally there's all kinds of fire restrictions, window openings, and we were able to really work with creative ways of sprinklering and doing things to open up these side views that are normally very hard to do. <clears throat> we also uh, worked with uh, bronze, leather, stainless steel mesh to really create this kind of sensual experience uh, through the project. And always kind of foregrounding, again, this idea of foreground relative to background. So the ravine is this sound <coughs> condition and creating new foreground relationships. And that the stairs, we actually thought of almost like landscape stairs. So you, you kind of descend down almost into a landscape itself. And then, you know, this is what it looks like when a couple hundred people are there with you. So in the stairs, we're using cast bronze, stainless steel mesh. Uh, the wood in the back is actually white oak. And then the walls are poured in place concrete. These big structural elements, one is a elevator, the other is a fireplace. And then a view where, in effect, the dining room becomes a balcony for the performances. And so these domestic spaces actually uh, become more public at different times of the uh, of, of their use and then this kind of sense that you're you've entered a ravine and so even though you're inside you feel like you're more outside so here you can see the denser fins above and the more regular fins below and every fourth one is structurally um, uh, loaded from top to bottom and then a sense of again this kind of winter light that we have and the way that things transform quite dramatically and then, you know, again, this kind of experience as a kind of, uh, as part of a concert. Um, and then the sort of sense that you can continue to descend, but you're almost outside the building as opposed to inside. And then, again, using a white oak uh, 
uh, limestone and kind of thinking about how all these materials come together within the project. So this is a different view of that same stair, which is kind of feeling more outside than inside. And then at the lowest level, uh, uh, there's a pool, and again, thinking about foreground in relation to background. And this is a winter view where the pool and the water, even though it's inside, becomes a reflection of the ravine on the outside. And then the same experience in the summer, there's a 35 foot long window that's on a hydraulic jack that descends totally into the ground, and then you're really outside. Um, and then we designed uh, a, a stair, which is all uh, hand-blown glass. Um, the, the, there's a skylight above. There, the treads are glass um, that bring light to another stair below. And these are hand-blown plates of glass. Uh, they're laminated on the back. And then we have uh, these uh, bronze clips. Um, so that the stair is viewed from different parts of the project. So you're seeing little glimpses of it and never the whole thing till you actually are in the stair itself. And this is a view of the back of the stair. So there's a white laminate at the back and then these cast bronze clips look like musical notes and there is a stainless steel raw uh, cable that holds the whole structure up. So it's kind of like a piece within the larger piece. And, um, and then the concerts have been amazing. The musicians have described it as actually like being in an instrument. Um, and, uh, so, and what's been incredible is the contemporary dance, uh, music. Uh, this is Steve Reich and a Toronto group called Nexus. Uh, this is Philip Glass, pretty wild, uh, to be kind of in a space where he's playing and the music and the space are sort of working together. Uh, and then, you know, boys and girls clubs, local charities that are really in the neighborhood. Um, and then also this is uh, the Aldenburg Connection where it's actually voice and piano. So the kind of range has been pretty remarkable. And this kind of, again, the way that in effect, um, you're not just, you're in an instrument, in a ravine, in a city. So the kind of layers are, are pretty interesting. Um, so, so what I thought, so those are two built projects and I think they were really the kind of ones that I thought you guys were really interested in when uh, you invited me. Um, there are two projects that are in the works and I thought it would be great to show work in progress that as opposed to finished things that again are a lot of experiments. So I'll go through this really fairly quickly. Uh, we're, we've been working in Moscow. This is a site on the Moscow River uh, that used to be owned by the Tsars. It's an amazing pine forest. And we love forests in Canada, but this is a pretty special forest. It's actually a Scots pine. There's very little understory, and the trees are truly majestic. So you're seeing a summer and a winter version of the same forest. In our project, we often start with really like crappy little study models. Um, but the idea was that it was a series of terraces in the landscape. Uh, so that's kind of the kind of bigger idea um, and that we actually work with sketches and drawings. We wanted to create a whole series of porches um, and we actually study them in drawings but also sectional models where you're seeing the way light comes in, the role of clear, so you, you experience the light but you don't necessarily see where the light is coming from. Uh, it's almost like a big long ship in the, in the forest. The client said take down as few trees as possible which is really a challenge because there's a ton of trees and so we kind of wove this thing through the forest itself and uh, it's extremely elongated. Um, the kind of uh, main portion that's double height is actually shaped bricks and then there's a long loggia piece and all of the piers are also clad in brick. So here you're seeing the kind of double height, the main store project and then this long linear galleria and then a smaller program at the other end. And then sketches where we're actually trying to explore this kind of brick facade. Um, and we work with a company called Pedersen Tegel out of Denmark. And uh, so here's a mock-up in our studio. So we actually had them ship all the bricks and we had Toronto bricklayers lay them up and you're seeing all different kinds of grout different colors, rake joints, flat joints, to really test how that should be done. 
Uh, they designed, we designed 24 different bricks and work with them and you're seeing all of some of the different ways that the shaped bricks create fins, uh, pointed fins, and then this undulating brick wall. Um, so we were working really directly with the brick company to create these uh, specialty bricks for us. And here's a mock-up on site and in a way what we loved is we have, we're combining the bricks which are very handmade, hand glazed, with these horizontal lines of steel and that we, we actually wanted them to be snow catchers where, where Moscow is 54 degrees latitude and the way that in effect you get this kind of these little kind of mountains of snow in the winter and the building actually is thinking about that and absorbing that and accepting the winter climatic zone which is about six months of the year and also thinking about the other seasons as well. So he, these are, these are, it's still under construction, but you're actually seeing this brick wall with the forest in the foreground. And you're actually seeing this kind of, uh, looking along the face of it. So these are the brick piers. And then this is a view uh, taken a little while ago where you're seeing the kind of low sun angles, uh, the horizontal elements, and this kind of undulating shaped uh, brick. So uh, not finished, but in progress. In a very different part of the world, we're working in Hawaii. And uh, so this is an area on the east side of Oahu, of one of the seven, eight islands. And that those two islands on the right are the Mokaluas, which are very famous. Uh, right behind you, there's a kind of mountain that looks like it's like a sculpted piece. It's like a kind of curtain. Uh, but it, it's actually all stone, so the, the years of water and wind have shaped this kind of incredible landscape. Um, and, that, so, and these are the Mokaluas that you can see from the beach. And so part of the project is to link these two natural elements. And normally when you're on the ground floor you can't do that, so we put all the public rooms on the second floor. And then we experimented with different umbrellas. Um, so this is a series of studies of this, this upper roof. And we work a lot in like plywood, cardboard, basswood, um, and we're sort of looking through the kind of evolution. Uh, we 3D printed all of these connector pieces um, and really tried to see it as this kind of big wooden umbrella. Um, so this is a, a perspective where when you enter the house, you're actually in a double height space and this wooden piece actually becomes your canopy when you first enter. And then as you go along, there's skylights in it, uh, and you're walking along toward the Mokaluas, and this is a, what they call a lanai space, so it's a covered outdoor space, which is very Hawaiian. And then you also look back to the mountains. So this idea that the kind of, these two natural features, which are kind of almost invisible now, become your primary experience. Then at the same time, you can't avoid anywhere in Hawaii not seeing this kind of idea of nature embedded in everyday life. Everyone's wearing these aloha shirts with kind of like patterns everywhere. It's just like you know, every consultant we work with are all like, I've never met one that doesn't have one of these shirts. <laughs> like 10 different times, different colors, different days of the week. <clears throat> um, but it's really a way, an, an embedding of nature into the way that they live. <clears throat> and so we were really inspired by this. <clears throat> and so we, we developed a concrete waffle slab for the main floor and actually wanted it to be a kind of more, as opposed to generic, more specific. So this is a whole process where we're again, working with paper and then working with plaster casts uh, <clears throat> and kind of really trying to kind of develop uh, a, a kind of um, a language then multiply it, so this is kind of uh, uh, looking at a kind of series of them, and then we illuminated them, um, then we worked with a company outside of Toronto, uh, uh, and this is uh, the positive, so, so the positive is done in styrofoam, and then painted with body paint to be kind of like, kind of smooth. Then um, these are the yellow are rubber molds done from the styrofoam positive. Then every piece has, they build a box around it because 
but this is ultra high strength concrete and the concrete is, the pressure is so huge. The ultra str high strength concrete has no rebar in it. It's all these fine fibers and it's a stronger than steel, so it's incredible. And then the pink ones are what they put inside the mold so that as they're pouring it. So there's a kind of whole sequence. And then this is a mold. So you're seeing the texture of it and the shaping of the coffers and then we'll add the LED lights inside. So we did a full-size mock-up of kind of one bay looking at a few different conditions. So that's the above. You can see them pouring the concrete in it. And then this is the below. So here it is like they just did it in part of their bigger shop and we did four petals but also a slightly edge, one of the edge conditions at the same time and then a view from the underside. So you can imagine that being your entire canopy on the ground floor. So really working with lighting consultants, fabricators, structural engineers to kind of really test ideas that are not the kind of, you know, I'll order that from a catalog, but really developing a language that really is in keeping with the kind of uh, architecture that we're trying to achieve. So I guess I would say, um, in closing, we really think about site as, and place is so essential to everything. Light is a critical factor in shaping our thinking. Winter, summer, the, the seasons for us are really important to celebrate and to appreciate. And then this kind of um, need to really address issues of materiality and craft, um, which is something that is, I think, becoming lost at this part of the 21st century, but we have tools that can certainly um, allow it to become much more vital in architecture. And um, I think we've been really fortunate to work with really great clients um, the, that are quite varied, but really are interested in architecture as a discipline and uh, often hard to find and very rare. So, and then again, this interest of the scale of landscape, the scale of architecture, the scale of furniture, and then all of the kind of fittings are all important because they're really about creating very rich spatial experiences that move from inside to outside. And the world that we're in, you know, everything is so specialized. So there are, you know, interior decorators and there's envelope specialists and there's landscape architects and there's, and you can see the dotted line where one person's scope ends and the other person begins. And sometimes they don't hang together. And you can, you, all you're reading is the disciplinary boundaries as opposed to thinking about the spatial experience. So I guess we're, we're trying to kind of maybe offer in a much less corporate way, a less professional way maybe, because we really think about all of these scales together. We think about all, you know, so even though we're not landscape architects, we design the landscape. But we love working with horticulturalists who really know their plant material. And, and, so, and as opposed to specking a door handle, we'd rather design a door handle that actually has a specificity related to the place itself. So, you know, different budgets, different scale projects, you, you focus on different things, but I guess we really enjoy that kind of range of kind of ways of thinking about design and that really it's more about a spatial experience that is the final outcome that then it kind of, you know, the kind of the dotted line of where one discipline begins and the other ends. So we're, we're really not so, um, focused on that, but thinking about kind of multiple scales at the same time. So thank you very much. Do you guys have any questions? How do you um, structure your office to avoid specialization? Uh, we have a small studio. Um, we work on all, like Howard and I work on all the projects, so it's not like your project, my project. Um, and uh, uh, so, and we just make lots of stuff. <laughs> uh, uh, so so I, I, mean, I would say that, you know, a more sort of corporate office, different principals would have their own projects. Uh, there would be a kind of way of, uh, you know, the teams that you build kind of, create that sort of separation and that in our studio it's not big enough for that to happen. So it's a bit more like your space out here where everything's all in one room and you're kind of like uh, 
you know, you can't avoid knowing everything, so about everything. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, no. In your house for the um, Catholic nuns, like when you started off with a mission statement as opposed to a sketch, how did that like significantly different starting point um, affect your process? So the question was about the Catholic nuns and how does uh, starting with a mission statement as opposed to a sketch uh, impact the project? So I would say with the nuns, uh, we were dealing with in effect 150 clients <coughs> uh, because they all had different opinions. There was a group of five women that were elected every four years to be the, their leadership group and we went through three leadership groups in the time that we worked with them. So, so in a way, that, that was changing. And, but we wanted to ensure that this was their home. It wasn't like, you know, you design a university building, people come and go, it's a kind of, there's, this was actually their home. And so we, it was kind of important that there were a set of values linked to the design. And so I would say that mission statement is more about what their values are and what they believe in, and that it was a guide to help us make decisions. So it wasn't the design, but it was actually a way of decision making when you have like a, a client that's a kind of like 150 as opposed to one. It allowed them to speak with one voice through the mission statement, and then we use that mission statement to help make decisions. So, so I guess it was a kind of, um, it was a way of embedding who they were into the design process without everyone saying, oh, I wanted this or I wanted that. Like it wasn't like a list of things that each person wanted, but it was a, it was a way of guiding, it was, it was articulating for not just what their values were as a community, but what their values were as it related to this new home that we were making for them. So, um, um, so and it was, I think you have to design not only all these scales, but you have to design the process to realize a building as much as the building itself. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say that I, I find your work really um, refreshing and I appreciate you going through uh, the drawings that kind of lead up to the projects and the detail. Uh, I had a question about the house for the integral house. Yep. And I wanted to know what how acoustics maybe helped to shape the project since it was a musical. Yeah. Really good question. <clears throat> uh, so uh, our client, because he was a concert violinist, acoustics were super important. Uh, but what he said is that uh, I didn't want to, he did not want us to consult an acoustician at the beginning because he figured they would say it should be a shoebox and he didn't want to live in a shoebox. <laughs> so this was his home and it was this amazing, you know, location relative to the ravines. So we actually, and it was very complicated zoning-wise. So there's a, there was this conceptual zoning envelope and we couldn't penetrate, it was a whole bunch of zoning stuff. And so what we did is that one of the early models I showed you, the one looking in plan, this big wooden model that we made, we actually had several acousticians come to our studio. And we said, don't do any calculations, but A, do you think it's gonna work? And B, how do you think we can make it better? And so they all came and they looked at the model and they kind of thought about it and that they, that they said they all said intuitively that they thought it should work because of the curvilinear forms and the kind of but they then they had tons of little suggestions. So the shaped in so so if the one wall is doing this, there's another liner where the balconies for the dining room and the kitchen and the living room are, these upper balconies. And they really talked to us about ways to shape that profile, the way that the materials that you could use on that inner wall could rich in, rich, make the sound richer than it was. And so, there's, and so we really listened to their suggestions that didn't impact the actual space itself, but actually helped to, to kind of um, amplify the, the space through sort of um, profiles and material selection. And so, so we were on our kind of like, we were kind of nervous. The first concert was pretty amazing because our client commissioned a composer to do a piece. <coughs> and and it, so during the rehearsal, you couldn't really tell. It wasn't until there was an audience of 200 people and the musicians 
and the sound is pretty remarkable. So in a way, they've actually done some recordings in there. Philip Glass really liked it as a space, uh, and, and there's just been such a huge range of different kinds of musical events there that's been really, really great. And our, our client's uh, position was that arts groups need to build, make friends. They not only need a place to perform, but they need to build an audience around what they do that's dedicated and loyal to help support them. And so he was using this space as a way to, it was like a friend building space, and so he wouldn't necessarily write them a big check, but he would let them use the space as a way to kind of um, build their audience. Um, does that kind of answer your acoustics question? Yep. Thank you so much for showing us your work. Um, I was really struck in the beginning of your talk uh, about the number of times you referenced being in Toronto. And so the whole idea of developing a regional architecture that draws so much information from the locality, the geography, the kinds of trees that grow there, so much about um, the ebb and flow of light. Are there is there enough, and I, I ask this question really as someone in a school, is, are there another set of preoccupations perhaps that inform your work that are not so regionally bound but perhaps tie into a set of ideas of architecture that come together in this you know, really unique practice that is, seems to be very much driven by thought and experience? Um, I think it's, you know, I would say for much of our early work, we could, we could literally drive to every project that we were working on. Uh, they were all within three hours of our studio. And now we're working in Moscow, Hong Kong, Hawaii. Uh, so I would say that the kind of issues that you have to address, in, it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I would say that there are themes that go through the work regardless of the place. And I would say, but there's a, a kind of under, trying to understand the specificity of that place as opposed to something that is generic. Um, so I would say that the kind of question of what the appropriate materiality is for these different sites is a kind of ongoing question. And we do a ton of research to really think about the kind of uh, what is the right uh, and appropriate expression. Uh, you know, just Moscow is different from, you know, sort of Hawaii uh, or Hong Kong. So, so it's a, it, I would say it's been really interesting for us to kind of expand the kind of conversation beyond the kind of, you know, local context and to think about uh, these questions in different places. Yeah. Um, I was just curious about you using so much glass in your place on Canada. Um, is it how much effort do you have to put in to make sure there's no baking or like, you know, things happen during the winter? Like, um, how do you do with the temperature control? So the question is about uh, using a lot of glass in Canada. I mean, I think that uh, in a way, uh, much of our construction is contemporary as opposed to kind of a wall with a punched opening. Um, I think that in a way the performance of glass is pretty amazing right now and that it's never really just a glass box but actually used in combination with lots of other things. So, um, so I think that it, um, I think that it's definitely possible and you know I think you just have to think carefully about wall assemblies and uh, you know the way things are constructed um, but I don't think it's really an issue about glass versus built wall or you know I don't think that should be the driving thing that you think about Great, thank you.